Okay. Well, welcome everyone again to this next in our cross BRC tick webinar series. My name is Rebecca Wadham. I'm at the University of Virginia. And today I'm going to be talking about comparative genomic analysis. And the example I'll be using is Borrelia. This, <clears throat> I'll be show you how you can do a similar analysis in the Bacterial and Viral Bioinformatics Resource Center. Uh, the bacterial is recently part of Patrick and the viral is IRD and Viper. Okay, there we go. Uh, this, as I said, is part of our continuing tick webinar series that we have with our sister BRC, ViewPathDB. ViewPath has the invertebrate vectors and the eukaryotic pathogens. So the um, previous webinars are available and you can also register for the last two after this at ViewPathDB. So for today's example, <clears throat> I'll have to pardon me, I have a bit of a cold. For today's example, I will be looking at this particular paper. Anyone who has um, seen my webinars before in this series knows that I pick a paper and then I try to show you how you could do a similar analysis in BBBRC. So this is the paper I chose for this time, which is an analysis of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease. And this was conducted by researchers at the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. Nita Jabari is the lead author, and it was published in June of 2018. And, you know, in all the time that I've worked on Patrick and BBBRC, I'm sort of chagrined to admit that I have never looked at Borrelia. And so, I, as with each of these webinars, I've learned so much about this really fascinating organism. And when I first started looking at it, I don't know if any of you have seen the that sci-fi classic 2001 a space odyssey well the final line of that movie is that astronaut dave bowman's saying my god it's full of stars and when i first looked at beryllia my thoughts were my god they're full of plasmids so this is a really different way to do an analysis for me so i really enjoyed it and i hope you will too so the authors isolated a virulent strain from the kidney of the white-footed mouse, Paramiscus leucopus in Minnesota. Uh, and they note all the plasmids that it has. And at the time, they did a comparison um, of the main chromosomes and the plasmids in a number of strains, but specifically they drilled into four of them. But we're gonna try to recreate this. Now, the authors <laughs> used RAST in their analysis. And at the time when they first, and of course, uh, BBBRC uses RAST toolkit, which is the mm, sibling, the child of RAST. Anyhow, everything's annotated the same way using the RAST toolkit. And the authors, because they wanted to do a deep dive on each of the plasmids, they annotated them all separately as well as together. Luckily enough, all of this data is currently in BBBRC, so we don't have to bring any other data to do this, although of course you could in the analysis. So they went through and looked at the plasmids and looked at presence and absence of all of these plasmids across the four principal strains. And I think that those were really probably the four principal genomes that were available at the time, although there are a lot of plasmids associated with um, this genus. They did a phylogenetic tree and they have a lot of figures like this where they show, um, trying to show presence and absence of genes and um, different changes. This is in the main chromosome, which, which is what they used to generate the tree. They did a deep dive into specific plasmids. This was the plasmid LP28-8, 
and you can see that they combine their strain, which is the MM1 strain, with other plasmids 28, uh, plasmid 28 8 uh, genomes from these different organisms. And that they're, what they're trying to look at is genes that are shared and genes that are unique. And so I wanted to see if we could do something similar in the BVBRC. So let me get out of the slides and we'll have a moment of blackness. There we go. And I will just go to the home page and show you this. Okay. So um, this is our home page for BVBRC. We have tutorials on how to use everything. But first, let's try the easiest thing for me always. And what I did with this analysis was to go in and try to find the genomes that they were looking at in the service. So the easiest way to do this, because Borrelia is a top line organism of interest to NIAD, remember that in BBBRC, we have all the bacteria, but you can click on the organisms tab and then Borrelia, and you notice it says Borreliella which the taxonomy people have taken a name that's somewhat easy to say, Borrelia, and for some reason changed the genus to Borreliella, but it's all the same. The data is all um, uh, arranged that way. And when I click on that from the organisms tab, it takes me here, which is the landing page for the genus. And you notice we have a number of tabs with all the information here. But you can see at the top, it says that there are five that I can see, because I'm logged in as myself, there are 5,732 genomes within this genus that I can see. So let's click on the genomes tab. And if there are questions, some of you should mute your mics because I can hear papers rattling and stuff. But if yeah, when I went out and muted them, uh, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep an okay. eye on that. But yeah. But if you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or I think you can do it in the chat. I can't really see the chat, but if you have questions for me, let me know. Okay, yeah, so absolutely. I'll monitor the chat too, and I'll, I'll interrupt you, Rebecca, if there's anything okay. you need. Okay, thank you. So you can click on the genomes tab and what I want to point out is that I have, in the course of preparing for this webinar, I've done all different kinds of analyses and I've re-annotated plasmids and genomes and this, that, and the other. So I have a lot of private data here. So you can click on the filters tab and you can see under public false 31, those are my private genomes and true 5,701, that's something everybody can see. When you're logged into the resource, you will not see my private data, but because I'm sharing my screen, you can see it now. So let's see if we have the author's genome here by using this text filter, MM1, that I put here for keywords and then hit return. And sometimes we have to wait a minute for it to come back, but you can see 43 results. Some of them false, some of them true. So, oh gosh, what am I supposed to do with this? Which one of these do I choose? Well, for my analysis, you can see here this, the strategy I could go with complete genomes, plasmid genomes, or whole genome shotgun. I want the complete genome. So here I have that MM1 genome and I click here. And you notice when I click on that checkbox, it populated the vertical uh, green, ball, green column with icons of things that I can do, possible downstream functions once I have this. And also beyond the bar, it gives me all the information about this genome, like it's a PAC bio sequence. I can see the publication if I click on that. It'll open up a new tab that shows me the publication for this. Whoops. And I could also click on the GenBank accessions for each of the plasmids. And actually, this is pretty useful because it gives me the names of each of the plasmids. But 
here we are. One thing I want to do is create a group because once I have a group of all of these genomes, then I can just rather than enter them individually in every single downstream tool, I can just use the group. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to create a group. And if I had an existing group, I could add it to that. But I'm going to create a new group and I'm going to call it Borrelia example 17 May. 2022. And I could save it into a folder or I could just leave it here. So I'll add that. And then I'll get a little message here saying, hey, you added it successfully. So let's quickly go through and try to add in all of those genomes. So the next one was the reference strain, which is B31. And Actually, I want this one. I'm sure that this clone 5A1 is fine, but I don't, I don't want clones. I want the real thing. So I'm going to add that to the existing group. And just to see what that is, I can click on the down arrow and just add that in. And then the next one, you may be asking yourself, where, where am I getting these from? I'm getting these from, let me see blow this up so you can see it here. So we did MM1, I'm doing now B31. So let me remove this to the side. <clears throat> and then I'll do JD1. And add that. And then I could just, you know, also type in, start typing and it'll give me suggestions. And then when it's added successfully, the little box will go away. Uh, P-A-B-E was another one. So add that. I know it's a little bit tedious, but we're trying to recreate uh, what your research experience is like. I've already created this group, but I decided it'd be easiest just to show you. So you can see sort of how easy all of this is. And you'll notice here that each of these have multiple GenBank accession numbers because it's the main chromosome in all the plasmids. So I'm going to add that one as well. Then I have CA382. And this one, notice it doesn't, it only has one accession. So just the one. And then ZS7. And these are the genomes that were used in the original analysis. And then finally, N40. <clears throat> And so it should be a group. I should now have a group with eight genomes added to it. And if I wanted to check that, I would go into my workspaces, click on genome groups. And you can see, I mean, I've been creating workspaces since 2013, but to see the most recent one, I click on the column head here for created. And then I can see this example and that there are eight genomes here. So now once I have this in this nice tidy little bucket, I can go in and do different tools here. So one of the first things I wanna do is recreate their phylogenetic tree. So I'm gonna go back into tools and services and click on phylogenetic tree here. Now I could add the genomes one at a time, or I could just add the genome group. Now I could search for it, a text search for it, but the way when you click on this drop down arrow, it's showing you from the most recently created to back on down. So this was the guy we wanted. So I click add to move that into this box and it tells me that there are eight genomes there. And I could click on that to see all the genome IDs. Now I need to create a, an output folder for this particular job, which I suggest you do. The more ordered you are 
in your research, the easier it is to find data. So I, there, I have a number of folders, but I'll create a new one here and I'll click on this, which is the create folder icon and I'll say Borrelia um, Jabari example and create that folder. And then I want to make sure it's here. So I'm going to scroll down. There it is. And then click OK. And then it auto completes it here. So now I also have to give the job an output name. And notice that I can't submit the tree, this job, until this button turns blue. So this is the next thing I have to do. Borrelia um, complete genomes. I always, I try to be as descriptive as possible when I name these things, because it just helps me remember at the end. Now I could submit it, but I have to now choose the number of genes. So this pipeline, what it does is it takes um, protein families. Any genome that's annotated in BBBRC is assigned at least one group of protein families. The cross genus families, which are we call the PG fams, um, are, come with everything. And that's so you can make these broader uh, comparisons. If when you annotate a genome, you, you uh, can say that it is a, of a particular genus, then you will get a second flavor of protein families, which we call the within genus protein families, we call those PL fams. This particular tool uses the cross genus families, the PG fams. And what it looks for when you have a collection of genomes, it looks for what we call perfect PG fams. And those are the, the protein families that each genome is present and it only has one copy of, of one protein in that family. So we have eight genomes here. It will look for protein families in which each of those eight genomes are there, and they each have one single representative. It's not going to take into account anything else. When it gets those, it takes both the amino acid sequence and the nucleotide sequence for both uh, for the genes in that and it builds the tree based on that. I've run this before, <clears throat> so I'm gonna do 500. And if you, if you have a genome of really poor quality that has a lot of, um, doesn't have a lot of single copy, you could use these kind of things that allow for duplications when you have a particular genome where a lot of genes are duplicated, so you can build a tree with it because it couldn't find those single ones or deletions, some genomes that don't miss that, if you can put this in, it will allow it, the um, pipeline to scale those. Every one of these that you do, it takes more time. So 500 genomes genes is gonna take a lot of time, but we're gonna submit it anyhow, because you know what, we don't have to wait. we have already done this. So I submit it. And Come here and put me, on the steps and do nothing. Did the job? You have your water? No. So we do need to have some people mute their mics. And now the job has been submitted. But you know what? I've already run this. So we can go in and see what this job looks like. So I'm going to go into workspaces. And I've shared these jobs with you so you can see them. So workspaces and then public workspaces. Rebecca? And Rebecca, while you... Oh, go ahead, Zachary. Sorry, I have a question. Um, so, so let's say that there are more than five hundred single copy genes. Um, how does the the um, the algorithm? Um, uh, uh, you know, how does it uh, choose? Yes, yeah, systematically choose which just, genes to it, include. It just picks them randomly. I mean, if you have something with five hundred genes, it's going to be a uh, well-supported tree, I think. If you if you're basing your gene your tree on like five or ten, then you might be a little bit worried about like if what if they chose um, 
you know, all hypotheticals and stuff. Right, but don't right. worry, we have a list of those. So I'll show you that. I'll okay. show you what Thanks. it looks like. Thanks. So in public workspaces, we're here. Let's click on BBBRC workshop. And this is where I stored all the data for um, all the workshops, but including the TIC webinars. So let's click on that. And then comparative genomics Jabari. So we click on that. And then let's go into phylogenetic tree. So I ran this tree a while ago. When you, you can see, I'm, I'm also going to show you a plasmid tree today. But um, when you see this little checkered flag that's like Formula One or NASCAR, or whatever, it means the job completed. So let's look at this with the 500 genes, genomes, or it's actually 500 genes. So anyhow, so click on that. And so this is showing me a number of things, different views of the tree. But what I really like, and what I think will men will address, what. Um, the person just asked is this HTML report that comes with this job. So I highlight that row and I click on the view icon. And first it shows me the tree that has all those genomes here. And you can see that it's got the bootstrap values for each of those. So it's a well-supported tree. And if I scroll down here, it gives me the facts on it. I had eight genomes. There were eight genomes with data. I requested 500 genes, it found 500 genes, it created 500 alignments. And it based the tree on 216,000 amino acids, it's closer to 217, 500 CDS alignments and 650,000 nucleotides. Those are are um, support values that you could enter directly into your publication. And I don't think that people would quibble about the power of this tree if it's got the, these number of genes and these values. <clears throat> so it gives me a list of the genes and it also gives me a long, long, long list of every one of those 500 genes. When I uh, used this service and submitted a publication a or submitted a manuscript, occasionally someone will come back and say, what genes did you use? Well, you can just download this because we have it as a text file that's available with the service. And that usually quiets even the most obstreperous um, reviewer. So let's look at the comparison between our data and the Jabari data. Hopefully you guys can see this. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Sure. Yes. Then how do you determine the core genes that are shared between different strains? Does it give you that? I can show you that, except I would have to do it in Patrick. Right now we're updating the service and I will show that to you if, you, if you're interested in seeing it. I would have to go into Patrick right now. What we're doing, is actually, let me finish this and then I'll show you okay. that. And it's pretty, yeah, easy, yeah. pretty easy thing to do. Okay. Um, and Re Rebecca, yeah. there's also a question from, looks like Frank, Frank Yang has his uh, hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Frank. Yes. Uh, so in their previous uh, paper, did they indicate how many genes they chose for the no, trade? No, they didn't. So, uh, but, but regardless of that, we have that the tree looks that has the same orientation. So I feel pretty good about it. Also, they don't have support values, whereas our tree has these boot, bootstrap values that show how well supported it is. So, so, uh, I might, uh, so in other words, uh, it's better to put those in material method. So for your, for your analysis, is that right? I agree. And, but okay. you know what? I, I would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see this. I'm not well, this is the Institute of Systems Biology, but it is back from 2018. But still, I always put that in. And when I review papers, and I review a lot of papers, mm -hmm. and I always pay close attention to this, and I will always um, call out for those kind of statistics because okay. I think the trees are so important mm -hmm. in the analysis. Absolutely. But 
but nonetheless. So, but see, that's what I, we are trying to do is give you the support data that you would need to do this to make it, because what we want, we want you to be happy because in your analysis, because when you're happy, what makes you happy is publishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you publish, you cite us. And that makes our sure. program officer happy and us happy as well. So we try to make it as easy for you to publish as possible. And that includes providing you with the details that you need to support your manuscript, which is those number of nucleotides and amino acids that are used to generate this tree. So all the information is there. So N40 is the outside one. And then they had MM1 and JD1 together. And you may say that's at the top and this one's at the bottom. You can flip these on the axis however you want. So, you know, it's the same orientation. So those are together. And you notice that here in this tree, they had Pali and Pavi together. And then close beside it is B31, CA382, and ZS7. So we have the same orientation. I'm going to move this guy to the side. And just for fun, up here, this is a, um, a breadcrumb. I'm going to go back one. And here's one I did just with the chromosome. This was with the complete genome, but remember it's looking for all the shared, all the shared protein families. But I also annotated all the main chromosomes to see if there was gonna be a difference in the tree there, there would be any difference at all, because this was harder to do. And then you notice N40, JD1, MM1, Pabby, Pally, B31, same orientation. So in this case, you could save yourself some trouble by um, just doing the complete genome. Now, somebody asked about the core genes and I'll have to go to patrickbrc.org to show you those because we're in the process of migrating some tools over. And whoops, the tool service is the protein family sorter, which we don't have at BBBRC yet, but I can add in that group, see how easy it is because I created it. I could choose the cross genus families or the local families, but because it's the tree, we wanted the cross genome families. And then I hit search. And so while this loads, I can tell you, you guys are getting something free today because I hadn't expected to uh, demo this tool. So this is showing me the pan genome across these, across these eight genomes. And it's saying that across all of them, there are 1,247 protein families. If I wanted the core genome, which is the genes that are shared across all of them, I could click here on present in all families. And then it tells me that there are 785 of those that are shared. And that's the core genome. But to build a tree, we need the perfect families, which is one protein per genome. So I could click on that and click filter. And it, those all apparently are perfect. So ta-da. And if I go and look at the heat map view of this, that's what, a per <laughs> that's what perfect families look like. Let me go back and do this so you can see the heat map view without it. And so that's showing you some of them have some things and not others. So that's what it looks like. And you can do things like cluster that and be able to rearrange the data. But, so I hope that answered your question about the um, core genome. And we will have this service, it's coming soon. We're calling it comparative services, I believe, which will bring in the protein families, the pathways and the subsystems. So when you launch a job like this, it'll save it into your workspace and you can always come back to it to see like that protein family sorter view. So Jabari et al did phylogenetic trees. We did phylogenetic trees and we have all that data. Another thing that they did then was a deep dive into the plasmids. 
And so I really had fun with this because I haven't done a lot of plasmid work. But the first thing I did was genome alignment. I don't know how many of you have used MOV, but our genome alignment service is based on MOV. And so I can go into it, the genome groups and then add that there. And it tells me, oh, how great, because the reference genome that it's going to base everything off is the same reference genome that they had here. Now, let me, hold on, I've got a screenshot that we're going to, I'll be coming back to again and again. This is what the authors used. And they looked at the different plasmids across the different genomes. So at first, I decided to try it doing MOV. And so I have to put it in, I'll put it in the same folder. I'll call it Borrelia MOV analysis. If I wanted to add to, to uh, readjust things, I could do it there, but I'm never really clear <laughs> what all of those things mean. So I'll just submit the job. But I've already run this job. So we can go back into tools and services, or sorry, workspaces, public workspaces, <clears throat> BVBRC workshop, TIC webinar, comparative genome, genomics Jabari, and then let's look at genome alignment. And I've also brought in pictures for you that I created, but this is the completed job. So you click on that and this is what the job looks like. And you look at that and I look at that and I think, I don't know what to click on. You click up here to see the view. So let's click on that. And it takes a few seconds to load. There we go. Okay. This is like one of my favorite visualizations in BBBRC. I just, I don't know why I like it so much, but I really do. So the red are the main chromosomes. And look as I mouse over that and look at the contig number at the, the contig at the top. So this is the main chromosome. And then we have one plasmid, a second plasmid. And in using this tool for this analysis, I learned that each of these are defining the different contigs, or in this place, the different plasmids. So I can drill into this a bit more, and I can go over a bit more, and you can even drill all the way down to the gene level here, like you can with MOV. But this green is actually one contig, two contigs, three contigs, four contigs, five contigs. And notice Rebecca, like- Rebecca, can I ask a question? Sure. Is, and you may get to this. I'm sorry if you if I'm getting ahead of you, but where you where it looks like rearrangements is that an artifact of just the way the plasmids were aligned or uh, associated with these? I, it, it's just the way the um, the accession had the plasmids in them, which to me appeared to be in no real order. It's not ordering them by size or anything else. It's okay. just the way that they came through. But that okay. let me actually show you this one because I went in and annotated this because then I was so I this is in the workspace so you can see it like this is the LP54 plasmid here and it's here and then you can follow the lines and see that you can find it here in this one which is the PABE strain but it's missing in N40 and JD1 and I'm going to keep doing this all day today sorry here, from the, from the authors, they think that it's present in JD1 and N40. So this is something, I don't know if they're, they were assembling different things, but this is, we're not agreeing in this at this point. Mob is telling me that these two genomes don't have it. Then these guys, they have the length and the GC number but do, do, do they really have it? Is it really there or not? So we're gonna dig into that in more detail here. But this, I, I just really like the view of this thing. I know I, I always enjoy MOV uh, playing with this stuff, but you can follow, so, go ahead, yep. So I just wanna ask again, uh, the, how do you know the specific uh, 
coding sequencing of the gene because it's it's not reflected. The annotations are not also yeah, reflected on. I know that's why. That's why. I mean, okay, it wasn't easy, and we because we haven't mm -hmm. done a lot of work with plasmids. It wasn't that hard either. What I could do is go here and see that this is contig CPO three one three nine seven, and then I could find that contig here. 303197 and it was LP54. So that's how I did it. I know it's not the best, but we really haven't thought about this that much. So now that we're doing with that, we did this kind of analysis, we can try to make this easier for you guys to use. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Yes? More like it. Yes. But I know with the previous move, you could still, I uh, think, import the G JBK files. I'm not sure if this tool would be able to do that. The, the J GBK file. Oh, the GBK file? I'm not sure if it, oh, let yeah. me go back and look at that. Oh, those are the ones. Yes, those are the coding sequences. Yeah, you can the find the genes here. But yeah. you know what? I, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't use mob. To do that, we've got a better tool for that that I'm about to go into right now. But let's go okay. back first and look at that mob. And this is what comes with it. If you think that there are different files that should come with it, this particular tool is still beta for us. But if you have a better understanding of mob or and things that you think we should include, go ahead, go into uh, help, contact us, and tell us what you think it needs. <clears throat> And Rebecca, just quickly to note sure. that with all of these files can be downloaded, and you can uh, you can just run Progressive Mob on your on your own yes. computer and load these files up, and, and then you may be able to, uh, you know, going to the previous question, you may be able to load up additional annotation files on there as well if it's if it's not possible through the web portal, obviously. But yeah, the Darling Lab in Australia um, they did Mob, but I noticed that they're not maintaining the script anymore. So um, actually the people at Argon have worked with, and I believe it's Andrew Darling also, you know, we're friends. So if there are specific things that you would like to see, let us know. So we have a disconnect. These guys say that this um, plasmid is there that here, and we didn't see that in mob. So I wanna introduce you to a tool that I really had so much fun with in this analysis to compare um, all of the, the, the uh, proteins that are annotated here. And this is called the Proteum Comparison Tool. So I go up into Tools and Services and I click Proteum Comparison. And once again, I need my output folder so I'll just use that one. I need um, a name for it. And this one, even though I have this genome group, I need a reference genome. So I'm going to go ahead and add the genome group here, the most recent one. But I need the reference genome, which is, so I'm just going to put the genome ID in here, actually because it just makes it easier because there were so many copies of the MM1268. All right, so there it is. I've used the unique reference genome ID here. And so I have this, and then I have these nine genomes, one of which is it, but I could go in and mess with this, but I have an example that shows this. So what this tool does is based on this reference, it does a bi-directional BLAST-P analysis and shows you the strength of the hits between this genome and the comparison genomes. So we click Submit here. And then once again, I already have the completed job in the workspace, although this one works pretty quickly, but we're not gonna wait around for it. So I go into um, Public Workspaces, Below, go into BVBRC workshop, go into TIC webinar, go into comparative genomics Jabari, and now we'll click on the Proteum comparison. 
And let's see, the one I did, I've done a number of them here because I just have a lot of fun with this. But let's do the one that had MM1 as the reference. So I click on that and it gives me a lot of stuff that comes down with it. But I want you to look at the view icon here. And so this, I any paper that cites us, I go in and look at it and I tweet about it and I put it on Facebook because that's part of my job. But I see how that people are using the resource. And one of the figures that people use most frequently is this figure. When I see, I can see, and in fact, I just had looked at some um, publications today that both of them have this figure in it. So it's showing the tracks from the outside to the in. This is MM1, which was the reference and the blasts against itself. So of course it's gonna be perfect. Then B31, then N40, then JD1, CA382, PABE, PALI, and ZS7. And so I also created a figure for this and annotated this for you so you can see this. So these are the different plasmids here. And I put this figure too in the workspace so you can see it. And so you can see this L L. <clears throat> LP54 here in <clears throat> MM1 and N40. And these are the strengths of the hits. So if it's blue, it's perf really great. If it's green, it's pretty great. If it's getting to yellow, it's less great. And if it gets to pink, it's out of luck. So it's looking like N40 and JD1, uh, they don't seem to have this plasma. You can go into the <laughs> downloads and you can get this image, but this is really cool that we have this genome comparison table. So you can click on this, but I've already done this for you. And this is also available in the workspace because it won't come with the, uh, I had to do the work of the plasmids myself. <clears throat> come on the little Excel file. So this is the Excel file that comes with it. And I just blew it up so you could see it see the names of the strains. And let me go to the view icon and make it even bigger for you. All right. So it's starting, the, the first one is the main chromosome. And in the first column, it tells you the contig that it's on, the gene number, the size of the gene. The next is the first gene called or the gene called for that. If it had a RefSeq locus tag, you'd see that. If it had a gene symbol, you'd see that. And this gives you the local, the within genus protein family, the cross genus protein family, what the gene is called, its start, its stop, and its strand. And then it's showing you the first comparison saying, Within this genome, Borrelia burgdorferi B31, there's a bidirectional blast hit with that. It's on this chromosome. This is the gene number. This is the size. This is the gene accession number. This is what it's referred to in RefSeq. If it had a gene symbol, like you can see with this one, you'd have it here. This is what it's called. <clears throat> And then here in this column, we have the percent identity and the sequence coverage. So it's showing you the strength of the blast hits. Now I'm gonna shrink it down so we can see a lot more of it. Okay, so this is across, you could just do a quick <clears throat> comparison across all of these genomes. And we're still in the main chromosome here, but you see it's maintaining the color so you can see things. and it, uh, the, the strength of the blast hits. And for example, this particular uh, plasmid, it's of course present in MM1, and you have some pretty good hits in B31, and not bad in N40, and not bad in JD1, totally missing in this guy. So you see how you can use this tool to explore this. And if I go down, I, as I recall, it's, oops, not down that far. 
Oh dear, sometimes one scrolls too far. Here's that LP54. So here are all the genes here. So you can see the individual blast hits between that and B31 here. But when we get to N40 and JD1, it's missing. Also in CA382, but it's present in Pobby, in Pali, and in ZS7. So I think that that's uh, sort of like a slam dunk in looking at this. And Sometimes I'm, I'm not sure how the original authors did this. What could happen is they just found plasmids that were associated with these genomes or its name alone that they were associating them with. One, um, so a couple of things, yeah, just quickly. So is it possible that uh, they were just using a different version of the genome when they, when they did the paper and then something was updated and somehow uh, you know, those two plasmids that may have been there in the initial submission, right. they're not there anymore. Because of well, I noticed that when they initially did the paper that some of the things that they said were present in MM1, I think things have been renamed since then because they've updated the, yeah. the GenBank accession. So I'm not saying like, these guys are totally wrong. That's not my intention <laughs> here, but it's more to say, this is a way that you can use this tool to dig deep into these things and look for presence and absence of this. And in fact, let me take this over. What and then I while you're doing that, while you're opening that and saying that Zach also had a question about how our gene arrangements, uh, rearrangements uh, handled. And I'm assuming you said by this tool, I'm assuming you meant by the circus uh, tool and not the nut moth, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you, I use this all the time for things too, because you can, oh, let me drill into this. Where's the view here? So let's go into 150 here. All right, uh, and let's go over to this guy here. So here's one thing that you can see here is like the gene order here. So this can tell you a rearrangement right, when I'm looking at things, I use this tool all the time to look for areas of lateral transfer where things are missing and where they've been rearranged. And I can see that when I'm looking at the gene order on these things. But we do have another tool for that that I'm gonna be showing in a few minutes. It's called the Compare Region Viewer. So I'll show you that in a minute. We'll be getting there, um, but I don't wanna, you know, I've got, I've got my flow that I gotta keep working with. But this is how I would use this. And in fact, when we're looking at, where are we at? Oh, I don't want L, I don't want the main chromosome because the main chromosomes are well conserved. But uh, like this one, there are pieces here. Look, it's 1276, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83. And then it's hitting, like I would say, this is a unidirectional hit and it's hitting place someplace outside of that. So this is a closed genome and it's getting these things. And here's the bidirectional hit. So those are one way that you can look for gene rearrangements in, in here. But we do have a better, a pretty good tool for that that I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. So I hope that answers your question, but we'll come back. We'll come back more to this, but one thing I did want to show, ah, move this over. Another fun thing I did was when I became really fascinated with the plasmids is I created a file with all the plasmids for those four genomes, the same four genomes that are listed here in this table. So what I did was I went to, actually I did it in BBBRC and I got all the plasmids that this guy had, and then the unique ones that this guy had and got the FASTA files and I put it in a text document and saved it. I called it all plasmids file. And then I, I an used the annotation service. And so I annotated that. So I now have a genome that's the all plasmids file. I think I called it all, yeah, plasmids FASTA. So I went ahead and annotated that. And then I used it in this proteome comparison uh, tool. So I just want to show you that because I thought it was really cool. And I thought it was a really good way to visualize this data. So I should have stayed there because we have to keep clicking in to see it. Uh, let's 
see, per diem comparison. And then I think all plasmids. And then let's do that. And then view icon. And so this is just against those same four genomes. And so this is the all plasmid file. This is the MM1, JD1, uh, sorry, D31, JD1, and N40. And so these are each of the plasmids. And I made another annotation of this that I also have in that workspace so you can look at it. And I just thought that this was a really cool way to look at this data. And you can clearly see who's lacking what. And you can see like the hits are terrific because these were all MM1 plasmids. And then these were the B31 plasmids. And then these were the JD1 plasmids. And actually M40 didn't have any unique plasmids that the other ones didn't, didn't have. So this I thought was a good way to or at least for me, because I to visually summarize this kind of data for the presence and absence. And you know, you may not be interested in that. You may like that kind of stuff. I don't know, but um, I just had fun with that. Another thing that the authors did, and this this is will answer, I believe it was Zach's question, is they did a deep dive on genes and genes rearrangements in this particular plasmid, which was 28-8, and they looked at M MM1 compared to 94A. And if you were to look at 28-8, pardon me as I drag this guy back, 28-8, it's in MM1, but it looks less so in these other genomes. And so that's why these authors went in and looked at other things like 94A, K78, PKO, VS116 um, and A14S. So I did the same thing. I grabbed these plasmids, created a group of them, and then looked at that in the proteome comparison. And this was just limited to a single plasmid alone. So let's see, it is this one. So let's look at that. And this is what it looks like when you don't have a lot of genes. This is each individual gene for this, for this particular plasmid. And I down, you can download the, uh, the uh, Excel file associated with that. And then you can clearly, I mean, 94A clearly has it and the other ones less so, the strength of the hits are weaker in these other ones that I was able to find. But one thing that we haven't mentioned is that these, uh, these are links. So I can click on per this particular feature ID and that's gonna open a new feature to the feature landing page in um, BBBRC. And this gives me the information about that particular gene. And it shows you the gene neighborhood. This is the guy I happen to click on, or, well, it's not a guy or a girl. It's just the gene I happen to click on. But this is the tool that I wanted to show you, the Compare Region Viewer. So let's click on that. What this tool does, and it's one of the oldest tools that we have in Patrick and BBBRC, it takes the gene you came in on and it looks at the gene neighborhood and it looks across all the data, all the genomes, bacterial genomes in DBBRC and says, who has a similar neighborhood? Now we have like 500,000 genomes in DBBRC. So the first view you get is limited to the NCBI reference and representative genomes. And it starts with the cross genus families the number of genomes is 10 and it's 10,000 base pairs. Well, I'm looking in Borrelia, so I'm gonna to change to the genus specific families. And actually I want all the public genomes, not just this one. So I click update there. And so you may be wondering what's this red arrow and this red bar while we wait for this to upload. This is the gene we came in on. The big square underneath it is showing the strength of the blast hit to that particular gene. And so we only have 10 here, 
So we can see the 10 genomes here. And then what you're seeing here is these colors are genes that belong to the same protein family. So you can see that it's, it's pretty well conserved here. And then you get some rearrangements here. So I think it was Zach that was asking this. This is where you can start to see the rearrangements here. And especially here, when you're coming through after this gene, here in MM1, we have this particular gene, but then here in PD16142, there's a different gene there. So this um, plasmid is 28,000 base pairs. So I'm going to go in and look at 20 and see if I can get them all and update that because I want to see the whole plasmid. Actually, I, I will go to the next higher one, but the resolution isn't as, as pleasing to me. So we've almost got the whole thing here and you can start seeing that there's some rearrangement here at the end. And when I look at this guy, you can see that things look pretty well conserved, especially with this 94A. But when you get towards the end of it, it's, it's messed up or not messed up. They have different genes in there. So I don't see 2094A here. Oops, I want to say what you do. I want to go up to 50 and update that. And sometimes 94A, ah, here it is, has come to the top. <clears throat> and now let me change this to 50,000 base pairs so we can see the whole thing. 50 genomes. 50,000 base pairs. And it's showing you the whole 50,000. I wish there was 30,000 because then it would be perfect. But look, you can see that this end, which was pointed out, and when you got to 94A, it ends here with this one, which is what we were seeing here because it's missing some of these genes from their figure. But as you move further down, you can see that other genomes have a different arrangement after you get past this gene. So this is where you can see the rearrangements in that. And you could export an SVG of this entire thing if you want, which I just did. And you could open it in Illustrator or whatever you choose to use. So that, I think, um, I really enjoyed using this tool because it was able to show me across an entire plasmid's rearrangements within these genes. So then I became more interested in these particular genes. And I wanted to, or the plasmids, not so much the genes. I should have been more interested in the genes, I guess. But I went in to, I'm going to go back over here and go into organisms. I just want to show you something real quick that I did and went into genomes. Come on. And then I clicked filters and then I clicked plasmids. And I just chose from this guy actually, it looked like CP26. I wanted to see if I could build a tree with the, of all the plasmids that were CP26 in the resource. Now this proved to be a little bit tougher than I thought. So I first wanted to look for all the plasmids. So I selected those. And then I can anchor the whole view on that. So I click the apply here. And now it's saying, oh, you're only looking at the plasmid genomes. And I learned that I had to do this through efforts because the contig names or the plasmid names, sometimes you can't search for them here. Like if I did CP26, it'll show me a list of things, but I don't know if it's right. So the way I found to do this was I could go into the sequences, come on, which are all the individual contigs, which you shouldn't have necessarily need with the plasmids. But then I could look at CP26 there, and then I could do a control find for CP26. And then I would be able to see those. And so I was able to create a genome group of those because I couldn't, uh, I, first I had to go see the genomes of those and then create a genome group of them. 
And then I was able to generate a phylogenetic tree of those. And I just wanted to show you that really quickly because I thought that that was pretty cool. So once again, we're going to drill down into this, take webinars, comparative genomics, phylogenetic trees, and then the plasma tree. And this is the CP26 uh, tree. And so you could see what was, um, I thought, nice to see was that all the CP26 that I were able, that I was able to find from were Dorferi clustered together, uh, Afzeli clustered together, Bavarensis and Garnii. Actually, my understanding is that Bavariensis is a subspecies within uh, Garnii. So they all cluster together. So that's just some of the ways that you can use this kind of stuff. So I know I'm running over, but I just wanted to quickly um, summarize for you guys. So let's do some comparisons. So the original authors generated phylogenetic trees, which we were also able to do. We did some whole genome alignments. We drill, were able to drill deeply into the plasmids using this, but this was, I thought, a really cool way to visualize the data and presence and absence of particular plasmids. And then the compare region viewer enables you to see different rearrangements within the genes. And also I was able to generate some plasmid trees. So any questions? I know I can never get this under an hour. I always want uh, No, to this, was, this was great, Rebecca. And obviously, um, uh, anybody I see Frank has his hand up. So go ahead, Frank. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that, that's, <clears throat> and that's a great too. Uh, I have a question. So um, does this uh, to allow us to uh, upload our own sequence? Yes, and you can create trees with that. That's what I did, for example, if I go into my genomes and you can see that I I could well, I created these genomes but if I went into the annotation service and I want to let's say annotate my own context the, the main thing is if you have an annotation from outside BBBRC mm -hmm. you have to translate it into this RAST toolkit framework so you're going to have to re-annotate it in our service but mm -hmm to make the comparisons. But look, I click on, I want to upload contigs and it's already looking for contigs in this file. Mm. And actually we don't want Gantt charts. I have some in downloads and you can see there's my plasmids fast A. Mm. And so I can upload that there and then, well, I'll just go ahead and do it. And then it appears here. Okay, so I can use that in the service. if you wanted to do assembly or the comprehensive genome analysis, which is a combination of assembly and annotation. Wow. I could go here. I could say I want to upload those. I don't know if I have any reads files mm. right in my downloads. Well, I know that those are contig files, but I surely have up. Oh, there's one there. So like, I, oh, that's a zipped file, but you get my point, right? So yes, you can bring that in. And then once wow. you have that data, you can create trees with your data. You can do proteome comparison. <clears throat> All of this is available to you because you're able to make these comparisons now. In other words, think, once, once we got uh, the raw data from the sequencing center, so we can directly go into here without yes. the, okay, yes. fantastic. And yeah, also awesome. if you have, you know, if you there's something at the SRA, that there's an SRR number that you're interested in. You can just run the accession here. You've got to bring it in and annotate it within the system to make the comparisons. But then once you do, all of this, all these comparisons you can make. It's not limited to the public data. It's your private data is virtually um, integrated with that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, next question. Oh, I thanks. I, I had the same questions with Frank, but I think you answered it. And then the I want to ask, does the tool also, do you have a tool where you can also 
just determine the plasmids, um, yeah, determine plasmids in your genome, in your genome. I wish, but we don't yet. We've actually been chewing on this for a while and we have a programmer who is sort of loosely associated with the project, but I don't know how much, um, how much success she's had with this particular tool. The best way <clears throat> I found was, you know, you take the complete genomes, if you know the plasmid, and then you could go into um, the proteome comparison tool. And so if I do have that plasmid genome, and then I could compare mm -hmm. mine to it, and then I could actually see the contig that um, in my genome has that. And then once I have that contig, I can re-annotate it as a plasmid yeah. if I want it to. Does that yeah, the challenge is if it's a novel, if it's a novel plasmid that you're trying yeah. to identify. Yeah, I know. I know. Like I said, I hadn't really paid much attention to plasmids or anything until I started this analysis. And then suddenly it's like, wow, this is pretty great. So I've been thinking a lot about it, but obviously I need to think a bit more because, um, and we all need to think more. It would help all of us at the project to think more about that. I'm not saying you guys, but I think this is the first time we've really used this kind of example. So it's pretty cool. But it's a good tool, I must say. Yeah. And it is Thanks. a great opportunity for, for anybody on this call or, or your colleagues, if you have ideas of how to do this, is to, to drop a line to BBBRC and, and yeah. sort of make some suggested tools or, or you know, uh, we're always open to hearing advice and suggestions from the community. So. And I'm like a plasmid fan now. I haven't paid much attention to it before. <laughs> yeah. Go into help It'll and click on contact yeah. us and then you can... Um, suggest things and we will look at them so yeah the more like a tool like more a tool more like a plasmid finder that will be that will be good yeah i know i think some of the developers are on the call yeah. so i hope that they're paying attention that'll be good any other questions i saw someone had raised their hand here i'll open the chat there done and the, the the chat was uh just thanking you for the presentation which is very nice um cool and as as rebecca mentioned earlier this has been recorded and we'll upload it you'll get an email with a link to the to the youtube uh and rebecca is more than happy to answer questions as well if you have oh them, yeah uh, I, moving down the road that's my job the next <laughs> one in two weeks is about flaviviruses and then two weeks after that it's going to be doing RNA-seq of um, showing you the RNA-seq analysis and the SNP analysis. So I encourage you, if those are interesting, of interest to you to sign up. And I really appreciate your guys coming. And um, I'm really glad that we did this webinar series because I is think- it, Is ahead. it SNP analysis based on whole genome sequencing? Yeah, it has to be reads. That yes, it is, and it's our variation service. So oh. you go into the variation and and you can do the reads, and then you click a target genome. And okay. oh my gosh, this is another tool that's so awesome in the kind of data that it gives you to show you um, the <laughs> SNPs and it ranks them. And uh, so sign up. Awesome. <laughs> Great. All right, Rebecca, I think we're we're good. We're already past the hour and I think uh, this was very nice. Uh, so thanks everybody. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, we will see you hopefully all in a couple of weeks. Bye. Have a great week, everyone.